My name is Ivan Klausen. I'm a master's student at the University of Oslo. Uh, and what I'm presenting is part of my master's thesis. Uh, so as the title suggests, I'm talking about a quantum Monte Carlo analysis of both Einstein condensation. Uh, but as the abstract also said, I'll be discussing a random number generator as well. So I'll divide it about 50-50 of those two. So first, uh, the random x random number generator, number generator, generator sorry. Um, uh, the reason I want to present that is because that could potentially be of use to other people whilst the Monte Carlo algorithm is just more of an informational thing. So, why do you need good random numbers? As I said, I will be doing a Monte Carlo simulation uh, later. Uh, and a Monte Carlo, Monte Carlo is basically a blanket term from any method that uses random numbers in some way. Uh, and the, the random numbers can be either truly random, pseudo-random, or quasi-random. The difference is uh, truly random is produced by some natural process that we believe is really random, like radioactive decay or other quantum uh, phenomena. A pseudo-random number is generated by some algorithm on a computer, so that's what I'll be presenting, a pseudo-random number gener generator. And the quasi-random numbers are not really random at all. They don't appear random. They are rather um, even in some sense in, in high-dimensional space. So what we'll be doing in the Monte Carlo algorithm is do a random walk that samples an integral. Uh, and if the random numbers are of low quality, uh, we can get wrong results, but it can be very difficult to know whether the random numbers are good or not, especially if we're generating new results that we don't know what the result is supposed to be. Uh, there's really no way we can know whether our random numbers are good or not. So all we can do is do our very best to choose a good random number generator. Uh, so what, what we want to do is, um, I want one sequence per work item in OpenCL. As we all know, we usually have thousands of work items, so each work item has its own sequence. And it's important that both the sequence of an individual work item is of high quality, i.e. the numbers are uncorrelated, but it's also important that the parallel sequences are uncorrelated, and that's, that's the major problem really today. It's a bit of an unsolved uh, problem uh, we saw in the last session. Uh, SPRNG is uh, one library that tries to solve this, but it isn't really solved theoretically. Uh, we just have good approaches. And the generator I'm presenting today has some nice properties that uh, provide strong arguments that it's a good in parallel. Uh, so one example of a bad random number generator is RANDU. Uh, some people here might have heard of it. It's a bit before my time. Uh, it was very widespread on IBM mainframes and other computers in the 60s, 70s, and probably later as well. And a lot of scientific results that were generated in those times uh, are really suspect today because they used RANDU, and we don't really know how the low quality of that generator affected the results. Uh, so there's an anecdote from the book Numerical Recipes. Uh, that somebody noticed uh, that the random numbers they were generating just fell in two-dimensional planes in 3D space, and they went to the system administrator or tech support or something and told them this. And they were told that we guarantee that each number is random individually, but we don't guarantee that more than one of them is random. <laughs> so uh, that reminded me of this uh, XKCD comic here. We could just design a random number generator. We just roll the die. We get four. Four is a random number, so we just return four. And the next time you call it, it's just as random this time. <laughs> it's not random in relation to any other number, but it's still just as random. Uh, so on the, on the concept of a die, we all know what a die is. It's usually used for playing Dungeons and & Dragons and Axis and Allies. I'm sure there are other uses as well. Uh, and the reason a die is random isn't really that it's a truly random number generator, or at least we don't have to evoke any quantum mechanics to explain it. Uh, the reason it's random is because it's a chaotic system, which means, uh, in this case, that uh, a small change in the initial condition, a small change in the way the table is, which will cause the result to be uh, independent of the previous draw. No matter how, how well we try to mimic the same draw, the system is so chaotic that just the tiny variations causes the end result to be independent. Statistically independent is the keyword. And we'll come back to that. So, when implementing a random number generator, there are several candidates. RAN1 was the first one I implemented. I'm not very proud of that. Uh, it is from the aforementioned book, The Merck Recipes. Uh, the good things about it is it's reasonably simple. It's not very many lines of code. It's also reasonably fast. It's not the fastest, but it's not bad. 
however, it has some shortfalls. It's, the period is 10 to the power 9. Uh, and on modern GPU, we can exhaust the period in less than a second. Uh, the, period, the period of random generators is simply how many numbers we generate before the sequence repeats itself, when it repeats itself over and over. So as I said, I implemented this first, and uh, I kind of got burned by that, so that's why I started taking random numbers seriously. Uh, I was doing a brute force Monte Carlo simulation, uh, which basically means I was just generating random coordinates and evaluating a function, uh, and I couldn't get a smooth result. I basically wanted the plot, and I wanted it smooth, and I just kept throwing more and more billions of Monte Carlo cycles on this, and I just didn't get any better, and of course, the reason was I was just using the same numbers over and over again. So then I started taking it seriously. Uh, another bad thing about RAND1 is it has a large state array. On the GPU, we don't want to use very much data at all, especially when we have, when we have one generator per, per work item. Uh, the RAND1 has uh, 33 values per generator, which is very much compared to the short period, so it, uh, it's not very good at all for, on the GPU. And also it has no parallel safety area, but, but the, uh, the period is so short that it doesn't really matter. It's not suitable. Another popular generator, both on GPUs and on CPUs, is Mesen Twister. Uh, it has some good sides. It's very fast. It uses just bitwise operations, basically. Uh, it has a very long period. That depends on the state size that can be changed, uh, but the default version has 600-something 32-bit integers in its state, and the period is astronomical. You're never going to uh, exhaust it. It's also been extensively used and tested by others, which is a very good thing for a random number generator. We need to know whether it's good or not, and the best test we really have is statistical tests, and that it's been used in many applications without any problems. Uh, Mercent Wizard also has a complicated parallel safe theory. It's, uh, it's not provable that it's safe in parallel, but it's considered likely by the experts. Uh, but it's a bit uh, complicated. It takes uh, a lot of computation to generate some uh, values to create these parallel instances. Uh, it has some downsides. It fails some statistical tests, uh, especially linear complexity tests. Uh, these are the tests in uh, test U01 test suite for random number generators, for instance. It has some failures, but uh, it's not known. I don't know any uh, actual applications where it fails. It also has, as I mentioned, a rather large state array, over 600 values, 632-bit integers. Uh, so if you want to use this on the GPU with one state per uh, work item, we don't want to store it. We can't store it in registers. We can't store it in local memory. Uh, so it would have to be in RAM, and that would be very, very slow. Uh, now, we can reduce the size of the state array. However, then suddenly we don't really know the quality of the generator anymore because it's the large state array version that's been used extensively by others. Uh, so, and it's also it's a bit complicated to implement. One way to get around this uh, large state array is to have one generator per work group. So we store... The, the one large state array in local memory, and it's shared among all the work items in the work group. However, then uh, you need to synchronize. So it's a bit complicated to use for the user, but it's, it's doable. And this, is, this has been done by others. And then we come to Randox, which is the, the random number generator I chose. Good sites, it's potentially fast. It also uses, it uses floating point arithmetic only, only addition and uh, multiplication. It's also been extensively used and tested by others. It's from 1993. has been used in a lot of simulations since then. Uh, and furthermore, the reason I really like it is because it has a theory for why it's a good random number generator. Most generators don't have a theory for why they produce random numbers. They just rely on statistical tests to prove that, well, to show empirically that they seem to work well. Uh, and this theory, it has uh, good arguments both for independent, the independent uh, sequences and the parallel sequences. It also has no known flaws. Uh, specifically, the test U01 uh, paper, I don't remember the author of that paper, uh, he tested a version where he glued two values together because Randox produces uh, floating point values, the 24 bits of the mantissa uh, are basically the output, and he glued two of them together to form a double with 48 bits, uh, random bits in the in mantissa. And, he, and it passed all the statistical tests. Uh, it has one downside. It's still a rather large state array. Seven float four variables, variables I store in registers in my implementation. So that, that depends on uh, your use case, whether that's acceptable or not. So the interesting properties of Randox. As I said, it has a theory describing what produces good pseudorandom values, and that comes from a chaos theory. Because it can be shown that Randox is a discrete uh, approximation to a classical chaotic system. 
uh, so it's, it's a discrete approximation. However, that approximation, the errors of the approximation only become visible when you start approaching the period length. And the period is 10 to the power 170, approximately. So we're never going to exhaust that, not, uh, not with classical computers anytime soon, at least. Uh, what this means, we talked about the die. The chaotic system means that it loses memory, we could say, of its state over time. Of course, this is an algorithm, it's deterministic, but uh, when we generate values, it means that uh, the, key, the, um, the correlations decrease the further away va two values are from each other. Uh, and it can be shown how many values we need to generate before all the bits of the mantissa or floating point, uh, floating point number are chaotic. So this, allows it, this, this gives us one very nice feature. We can choose if we want a fast generator or a high quality generator. So by discarding values, uh, we get fewer correlations, uh, and we handle this through a luxury value of zero through four. Where, zero, we, where with zero, we don't discard any values. It's very fast, but it has some correlations. It does fail some statistical tests. At luxury value two, it passes all tests, but we still know it's, it isn't uh, good. Uh, so this is rather interesting. We know for a fact that it's not a good generator at luxury value two, but it passes all non-statistical tests already. So by that metric, at luxury value two, it's just as good as pretty much any other generator. Uh, and at luxury value four, it's rather slow. Uh, to give some figures, at, uh, with the AMD Cypress, the HD5870, it generates roughly four billion values per second at luxury value four, and 20 billion at luxury value zero. So, yeah, and there's some nice consequences there. The parallel sequences, they're far separated from each other. Uh, they are chaotic. Uh, and this, this classical dynamical system, as I said, it's, it's a so-called K system. This is not very well known in the West. It's more Russian mathematics. Uh, but it has a property called K mixing, which is basically statistical independence. So it can be proven that the, the uh, classical uh, system that this is a discrete approximation of is statistically independent over long distances. Uh, and so we just we rely on the fact that we won't see any problems with this unless we really uh, analyze the whole sequence. Uh, yeah, and another uh, very nice feature is that we can glue together several, uh, several values. If you need more than 24 bits, you can just glue them together and get 48 bits, and then you can glue them together, and so on. With a normal random number generator, we can't really do this, because we can almost be sure that the least significant bits will have some nasty correlations. It's just that they don't show up in statistical tests, they don't show up in applications. But if we were to glue them together to get a big number, it's going to be really bad, because we have just some good bits, some bad bits, some good bits, some bad, yeah, bad bits. So, as I said, uh, this is something I implemented. It's implemented in uh, a C or C++ uh, initialization function that initializes the state array. And then that's transferred to an OpenCL buffer, and then the generator itself is in OpenCL. Uh, one nice feature is it's completely compatible with the original 477 implementation from 1993. So if you don't trust me, you can just check that it's generating exactly the same values. Uh, and in fact, it's available from this uh, address. And included there is an application that uh, checks the correctness against the known good values and also measures performance. So you can check that it works well on your system if you want to use it. And then just a short uh, example code on how you generate a, a, a four-component uh, random variable with the generator. You just pass in the state array. And then you have this... Um, Type def of a struct that houses these seven float for variables. And you download the seed, you can generate as many values as you want, and then you upload the seed again. There are some other functions as well, and this is all explained in comments in the code. All right, that's all about the random number generator. Now I want to switch to the Bose Einstein condensed solver. So, Bose Einstein condensation, what is that? Uh, we have two types of particles in the world it's bosons and fermions. Uh, the difference is bosons can uh, occupy the same quantum state, fermions cannot. So, for example, uh, uh, orbitals in atoms are because electrons are fermions, they can't occupy the same state. If they could, they would all just occupy the ground state and the world would be very different. So, bosons. A boson's condensation happens when we have a group of bosons. Usually, uh, in this case, what I'm simulating is, a boss of, um, uh, is, is, a, is an atomic gas atoms that are bosons in this case. Um, and they are cooled to almost absolute zero. What happens then with bosons is that they, they can all occupy the ground state, and so they do. 
And this, this forms a new state of matter uh, when a large fraction of the molecules in a gas are at the ground state. We call it the Bose-Einstein condensate. Uh, so it has some interesting properties. Uh, when this happens, uh, the quantum mechanical effects uh, become significant on a large microscopic scale as well. Uh, I haven't looked much at this. Basically, what I've done is implement a solver for this and I just uh, compare the energy and uh, the particle distribution to check the correctness. So, uh, so the point is to just uh, see how this performs compared to other codes. So, basic outline of the Metropolis Monte Carlo algorithm that, that I'm using. Uh, we just generate an initial random distribution of particles, say, we, we stimulate maybe 100, 500 particles, something like this. And then we do a certain number of Monte Carlo cycles for each cycle. We just uh, try to move a particle randomly. Uh, basically, we can do, do this randomly. We have a smart way to do it. We guide it to the more interesting uh, areas of space. But we can do it just completely randomly as well. Then we have a test whether we accept the move. And then we do this for each particle. And then we have done one Monte Carlo cycle, we say. And then we calculate the energy. Uh, and then the energy is what we're actually interested in, the energy and the particle distribution. Uh, and since we're just gathering statistics, we can run this thing in parallel because this algorithm in and of itself is not really parallelizable. It's a very serial algorithm. However, all we're interested in, in is uh, statistics. We just need a bunch of energy values and we calculate the average and we do some statistical uh, uh, work on it to find the uh, approximate error and that, that's what we want. So. Uh, what we do is we run this algorithm in each work item. So each work item has its own copy of, the, of a system, completely independent from all the others. Uh, and we just uh, sum up all the energies at the end. So this is uh, an example of a massively parallel application that's really easy to parallelize. Uh, so uh, as I said, open, in OpenCL, one system per work item. And then in addition, I've used MPI. A message processing, processing interface, which is just a, an API that lets us transfer messages between processes uh, to parallelize across more devices, either on one computer or on a cluster. So there are two approaches uh, that are used, variation on Monte Carlo and diffusion on Monte Carlo. And they're very similar. Variation on Monte Carlo, the idea is to guess what the wave function looks like. And the wave function of a quantum mechanical system is basically a magic function that tells us everything about the system. Uh, and the point is, for these many particle uh, systems, we can't really find a closed form solution for the wave function. So we have to try to approximate it. So what we do is we just look at the system and we make a best guess. We throw in some variational parameters that we can vary. And then we use this algorithm and calculate the energy. Uh, and it turns out that we can't possibly find a, a trial wave function that produces a lower energy than the actual ground state energy. So we can try any function uh, whatsoever. And the one with the lowest energy is our best guess for the ground state wave function. Uh, diffusion Monte Carlo, is, it uses the same basic algorithm. However, we add a step. Uh, in this algorithm, uh, after each Monte Carlo cycle, there is a branching step where some work items are killed and some work items are copied. And that's basically it. We just use the calculated energy and a smart rule. And that's Diffusion Monte Carlo. And Diffusion Monte Carlo does not actually need a trial line function. It can find the exact uh, ground state energy and that's the exact ground state particle distribution without us having, having any idea what the ground state wave function actually looks like. Uh, and that's, pre that's a pretty nice feature. However, uh, having a good approximation already from VMC uh, makes the DMC algorithm much more efficient. So basically, we do VMC first to find a good approximation, and then we use DMC to find the exact result. So the point of all this was just to compare performance uh, between my OpenCL implementation and other CPU implementations. So, uh, as always, fair comparisons are very difficult, and I can't claim to make like an authoritative statement on uh, performance for Monte Carlo simulations. Uh, so, all, what I've done is I've compared it to similar C++ implementations, where similar means it's the same algorithm. Uh, it's developed by other master students, people with the similar uh, skills of my own. It's developed in standard C++ versus standard OpenCL. Uh, so, initially, I did this in a course. And I, just, I was interested in GPU and OpenCL. So all I did was I downloaded a Hello World application from AMD, started modifying it. And then I just copied what I'd done, already done in C++ into a kernel and just changed line by line so that it was OpenCL compliant using float threes, now float fours at that point, and so on. And uh, the result was uh, just a 
completely direct port like that uh, gave me 60 times higher performance than a single threaded uh, C++ implementation without me really having any idea what GPGPU was or how to optimize for it. Uh, so that was rather promising. So I decided to continue doing that and uh, did my masters on it. Uh, so the final result, uh, I used an AMD Cypress versus a Phenom 2 uh, 1090T. However, these are uh, the C++ implementations are all running uh, single threaded. So it's basically the best, uh, the best possible uh, uh, run for them. They get all the cash for themselves, etc. So I compare this to uh, codes, both uh, similar codes that I developed in a course, a reference code from the course and uh, different master thesis a few years ago that simulated the same system. Uh, and the, the implementations are pretty much identical in terms of the algorithm. The only difference is the C++ implementations use lookup tables to not have to recompute some values, uh, but that works in their favor. Uh, so the Cypress uh, GPU uh, performs around 100 to 200. It varies based on uh, who I'm comparing to, at times faster than a single threaded C++ implementation. Uh, and that's, I think that's pretty good. Uh, this is double precision. Uh, we physicists, we're a, bit, uh, we're a bit scared of single precision. Even if you don't analyze it, we use double precision always. Uh, however, uh, double precision actually only performs at about 65% of single precision. Uh, I say only, it's, that's really good, I think. It's more than half. Uh, I would have expected less than half because we're doubling the amount of memory, we're doubling the amount of memory bandwidth we need. And uh, on the MD Cypress, as we know, the double precision performance is either two-fifths or one-fifths, depending on which operation we're looking at, or the single precision performance. So the reason, uh, there are some explanations for that. Uh, it's slightly more efficient use of memory, looking at the profiling results. Uh, higher ALU busy values and packing values, of course, because in double precision, the VLIW architecture basically becomes scalar. And also the kernels are small enough that there's no register spilling, uh, which is always a good thing. Uh, in terms of absolute performance as well, we can count flops, which I've done. Uh, basically, the only pla the place where the bottleneck is here is in the energy calculation, where there's an n cubed calculation. Uh, so what I've done is just counted the operations in the inner loop of that n cubed part. Uh, what I counted is a little bit over 80 uh, basic operations, additions, uh, and multiplications. Uh, and then there's two square roots and three divisions. Now, I don't know how many operations I should actually count them as. as if, you, if you use the kernel analyzer and you just do a square root, double square root, it's really ugly. And I have no idea how many operations I should really count it as. So if I count them as one operation, with the understanding that that's a gross underestimate, I get to 90 gigaflops of double precision uh, floating point. That's an underestimate, under, uh, both because of the transcendentals I mentioned that I only counted as one operation. And because uh, there's more overhead also, this was just the inner loop, but the kernel is bigger. There's also n cubed and now n squared and n uh, computations go on as well. Uh, so I think it indicates that I've used the hardware reasonably well. And this comes with no, uh, op no, no GPGPU optimization beyond storing stuff in memory so that when work item n and n plus one access the same particle, those are adjacent to memory. That's really the only GPGPU optimization I had to do. Uh, so, to conclude, I can't, I can't make the claim that GPUs are always 100 times faster. Uh, we never really can. There's always the question of how optimized was the CPU implementation, how optimized was the GPU implementation. Uh, however, I know that if I'm going to write the code using standard uh, C and C++, uh, then I'm uh, OpenCL or C++, then I'm going to be able to make uh, my code run much faster with OpenCL, just using my understanding of the basic language. So if the C++ implementation could be optimized much further, then I would say that CPU optimization is much harder than GPU optimization, which is usually, it's usually the other way around, as I understand it. Uh, so, as I said, I can't make any general statements, but it certainly demonstrates that there's, there's low hanging fruit to be had. These kinds of massively parallel Monte Carlo uh, uh, computations are not always done on GPUs, but they really should, as far as I can see because they really work very well, and there's, there's very little you really need to learn. You just write open CLC kernels, and then if you pay attention to memory layout, you're pretty much there already. Yeah, that's, uh, that's all I have. Thank you for listening. <laughs>